Coming up on Market to Market, campaigning for trade policies both foreign and domestic. The mushroom capital of the world makes an upgrade. And market analysis with market Elaine Cobb next. That will affect all of the milling wheat in North America. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. This is the Friday, August 30 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Delaney Howell is away this week. Despite a pickup in the purchase of goods with long lives, airplanes, dishwashers, and automobiles, fears of a recession continue to loom. Orders for durable goods rose 2.1 percent last month. Without the volatile transportation sector, orders fell four tenths of a percent. However, consumer spending grew six tenths of a percent in July as U.S. shoppers largely ignored increased prices brought on by the trade war. Those who opened their wallets helped push second quarter GDP to an annual growth rate of 2.1 percent. As of Sunday, if there is no resolution or delay, the U.S. will impose additional tariffs on a partial list of Chinese goods. By December, the duties could top $550 billion. The increase is expected to be countered by China with higher tariffs on U.S. imports. In what could be considered a campaign to bolster spirits among farmers suffering trade war fatigue and the sting of small refinery waivers, a bipartisan crew came calling on the Midwest. The push for USMCA passage came to an Iowa dairy production facility this week. Former USDA Secretary and current U.S. Dairy Export Council CEO Tom Vilsack, along with Iowa Senator Charles Grassley, toured the Anderson Erickson production facility in the capital city of Des Moines. AE does not export their products, but says trade does help the entire industry. The message centered on jobs that could be created if the United States-Mexico-Canada deal is ratified by all three countries. Uh, not only does it preserve and protect our number one market, Mexico, uh, which is incredibly important uh, as being a tariff-free market, but it also creates an opportunity for us to protect certain cheese names. The dairy industry has struggled in recent times, and Vilsack says more than 2,000 dairy producers have gone out of business over the last two years, reducing the number of operations to 39,000. It's an opportunity to get more poultry products, particularly into Canada, and there's an opportunity to get uh, higher quality wheat into Canada than we have under the NAFTA agreement. But also, uh, NAFTA needed to be modernized. But altogether, this is important for agriculture, for manufacturing, uh, and for the future and the predictability of it. Senator Grassley is optimistic the U.S. Congress will ratify USMCA by the end of 2019. House Democrats have concerns over labor, environment, and overall enforcement of the entire pact. Trade was on the president's mind when he made several appearances in front of reporters at the G7 conference this week. And we're transforming our country. We're taking these horrible, one-sided, foolish, very dumb, stupid, if you'd like to use that word, because it's so descriptive. We're taking these trade deals that are so bad, and we're making good, solid deals out of them. U.S. producers did get some positive trade news from the G7 involving Japan. It's a very big transaction, and we've agreed in principle. It's uh, billions and billions of dollars. 
uh, tremendous for the farmers. And uh, one of the things that Prime Minister Abiy has also agreed to is we have excess corn uh, in various parts of our country uh, with our farmers because China did not uh, uh, do what they said they were going to do. President Trump said Japan has agreed to purchase U.S. produced commodities like pork, dairy, and ethanol to the world's third largest economy by GDP. It will lead to substantial reductions in tariffs and non-tariff barriers across the board. And I'll just give you one example. Japan is by far our biggest beef market. We sell over $2 billion worth of beef to Japan, and this will allow us to, to do so with lower tariffs and to compete more effectively with people across the board, particularly the TPP uh, countries and, and Europe. And the president also indicated he'd spoken with China following last week's escalation of tariffs between the two countries. China called last night our top <clears throat> trade people and said, let's get back to the table. So we'll be getting back to the table, and I think they want to do something. They've been hurt very badly, but they understand this is the right thing to do. And Chinese officials denied making calls to the U.S. shortly after President Trump made his statement. Many of the farmers caught on the crossfire of the trade war are preparing for the looming harvest of the commodities involved. Iowa Corn Growers Association board member Mark Mueller was at the trade group's meeting this week calling for the Trump administration to uphold the integrity of the renewable fuel standard. The biofuels future isn't the only elephant in the room impacting producers. Our present administration has done a lot of harm to agriculture, like the small refinery exemptions. Corn demand is being decimated with the granting of these small refinery exemptions. I'm afraid that this administration is picking trade fights starting trade wars, but doesn't have an end game in mind, doesn't have a plan on how to win these fights. More than one entrepreneur has launched a business that quickly outgrew the garage to become a major employer in the community. Corporate giants Microsoft and Apple are new to the game in comparison to one business with roots in the East. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more in our cover story. Anyone in southeastern Pennsylvania worth their weight in Maitake knows the story of how the mushroom industry began here. It's not about the area's climate, terrain, or soil. The mushrooms all started back in the late 1800s. When a carnation grower's son saw waste of space under the carnation beds. In a Kennett Square city market, similar to this one in New York City. He was very fastidious and wanted to make the best use of all the resources. Took a steamship to Europe where they were growing mushrooms in Paris. And he brought in the mushroom spawn. So in 1902, uh, Swain and a fellow named Harry Hicks built the first building uh, specifically to grow mushrooms. Industry started to take root, support companies sprung up, and it just mushroomed into what it is today. Today, Pennsylvania is the nation's top producer of mushrooms, growing and picking 67% of the United States' 827 million pounds of the most commonly cultivated mushrooms, such as white button. California comes in a distant second, raising 11%. Chester County, and specifically the community of Kennett Square, have labeled themselves the mushroom capital of the world. The city of 6,000 holds an annual mushroom festival, serves mushroom-focused dishes in nearly every restaurant, and even has a mushroom-themed gift shop. It's great for the economy here in Chester County, and, you know, the industry probably employs probably 10,000 people, and it's, it's amazing. There's always jobs. We need pickers. We need all kinds of people in the industry. Yet it's not always an easy business. A new report from the National Agricultural Statistics Service shows the volume of all U.S. mushrooms slipping 10% over the past three years. Jim Angelucci, general manager of Phillips Mushroom Farms, says the startup and overhead cost are significant for those trying to get into the business. Labor, however, has perhaps been the biggest problem as some companies struggle to hire enough workers to pick their mushrooms. Like many dairy farmers, mushroom producers are not allowed to hire temporary international workers under the H-2A visa program because the work occurs year-round. Since 
We grow mushrooms 24-7, 365. We're not considered seasonal. My comment is, you know, our crop's only nine weeks long. We just elect to do it six and a half times a year. If we don't do something, I consider it a national security issue. Uh, we've got to have labor. And we're going to lose the salad bowl in California if we don't get labor. Phillips Mushrooms has been around for 92 years and is now the world's largest grower of exotic mushrooms. Angelucci said finding labor is still a battle for the company. Even with a new state-of-the-art mushroom farm, the company built just across the state line in Warwick, Maryland. Growers pick inside climate-controlled buildings with humidity and temperature set to the perfect range for mushrooms. However, that doesn't isolate the company financially from consequences of extreme weather. We don't have to deal with the elements uh, directly. We do. Um, you know, when it's 105 degrees here in, in the summer and our electric meters are spinning off the wall because of the electricity we're using to cool the rooms, that's a direct effect of, of the weather. The cost of doing business continues to escalate, the cost of compliance uh, with the government. The Warwick facility, where additional buildings are still being constructed, features stainless steel rather than the traditional wooden growing shelves. The complex was begun when the company decided to return to growing large volumes of white button mushrooms, which it had moved away from. The stainless steel shelves are easier to wash down when the compost, or substrate, is changed after a batch of mushrooms is harvested. Our Maryland facility is it's called the Dutch style of growing. We decided when we were going to venture back into growing white agaricus mushrooms in 2009 that we would look at state-of-the-art facilities to do that, food safety being the most important factor. So we spent a couple years going back and forth to Europe before we, we finally decided on the design. The mushrooms, as they have always been, are grown in a special type of substrate. Stall bedding from a nearby horse track is used, as is old straw and hay preventing that material from being tossed into a landfill. Some of the area's mushroom farmers own the composting facility as a shared cooperative, and the materials are blended and prepared for all. Angelucci, even before working for the Phillips, knew mushroom farming and how to work with the substrate. My father told me when I was nine years old to put something on the table beside my elbows. So he took me down to uh, our friend mushroom farmer down the end of the street, the Avello brothers, and I was a little kid on top of the pile with a hose, making sure that we had enough water in the compost to make sure that it reacted properly. Angelucci feels good about where the company and industry are heading, particularly if the labor problem can be resolved. And recent studies point to a possible connection between eating white button mushrooms and inhibiting the development of breast cancer in older women. The Mushroom Council is encouraging Americans who are considering becoming vegetarians to instead blend chopped mushrooms into their ground meats, becoming blenditarians. It's actually not replacing meat. Research has shown that the increase in beef, because of the blend, uh, they have incremental sales increase because people feel better about eating it now. A blenditarian is one who believes that the meaty, mighty mushroom makes meals more nutritious, delicious, and sustainable. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. Cool weather and a presidential promise prevented some commodities from adding to last week's losses. For the week, December wheat lost 15 cents, while the nearby corn contract was 2 cents higher. The potential for renewed U.S.-China negotiations was combined with questions about the length of the growing season to give the November soybean contract a 13-cent bump. December meal lost a dime per ton. December cotton added 62 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, October Class Three milk futures gained 22 cents. The livestock sector remained mixed as October cattle shed 47 cents, October feeders cut $1.73, and the October lean hog contract put on $4.23. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index skyrocketed 131 ticks. October crude oil expanded 99 cents per barrel. COMEX Gold dropped $4 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained more than three points to finish at $3.96. 60. 
Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Happy to be here. It's a shame we have nothing to talk about. Right. Thanks for making the trip. Nothing good. Nothing. Well, it depends. It depends. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's start with wheat, though. Uh, bearish pressure continues on this crop. Is that something that's going to continue? I think so. I can't, I can't foresee anything that could come in here to be bullish for wheat. We even had good export numbers this week for wheat. Uh, export year over year were 24% higher than last year at this time, but not even that kind of good news can do anything for this wheat market. When you have the dollar, as you mentioned, uh, it went up, you know, uh, I think about half a percentage point on Friday alone. Yeah, and it's if already at a four-week high going yeah. into today. So I think that's probably why you're seeing these double-digit losses in, in nearby wheat futures, especially on that Chicago board, but even the KC wheat price-wise itself is pretty grim. The futures are below $4, which means the cash, pr cash price is much below $4. And that all kind of makes sense just domestically. This is true for spring wheat also, where you've had pretty good conditions all summer, and this harvest is late. It's about 10 to 15 days late, but nobody cares about a late harvest if you're eventually going to get in all oh, of these bushels. And get a harvest. So yeah. do you cut your losses and make a sale now, or do you hold? No, and especially in the case of that spring wheat, where I believe some folks are having, uh, you know, the protein isn't there. You need to know what protein you have in your bin, get tested for falling numbers, and see where the market's going to shake out. Because I think right now there are lots of bushels, but the quality or the protein levels is not what it would be in some other years. So I think it would pay to know what you've got in your bins and make a marketing decision uh, months down the line. I'm not making light of the weather, but we do know Puxatani fill, and we see six more weeks of winter if we see him. If we see this new creation called Frosty Frank, we're going to get that frost in the next six weeks. If we see, a, if mm. Frosty Frank sees a shadow, the market looks like it's going to be headed up. We're really watching a frost, but it's already cool. Yeah. Continued cool forecast. Is that going to save the corn market? Uh, I, I'm actually, I think the soybeans will be more sensitive to that weather concern than the corn, but both of them will. Certainly if you have a frost scare in the near future, both of them would, would have a response. And there isn't at this point. I've checked, you know, the 10-day forecast even up in North Dakota where they have a good corn crop this year. Uh, so far, so good. But we are absolutely in a weather market. And it could be the case that six, six weeks from now nothing has happened, and so there is no response in the market. I'm not necessarily bullish from this alone. I'm just saying that every day we wake up and watch the markets and watch the weather forecast and we are absolutely in a weather market on that frost potential. We've been in a weather market but we've also been in a market where people don't believe things and we got a question via Facebook. This one came from uh, Dan in Geneseo, Illinois and Elaine he was asking us why is corn basis so firm if there is high stocks from last year and 169 bushels per acre in the field this year. Do end users not believe USDA or are farmers holding? That is an excellent, excellent point that he's making there. And it really sort of depends locally. The really high basis levels are in the Eastern Corn Belt, in Ohio specifically. They were as high as 65 over, now they're about 30 over, maybe as high as 40 over, which means $4 cash corn bids are still out there for folks in the Eastern Corn Belt. And it is exactly because the end users there can drive around and they can do a, a crop tour like anybody else and they can see that the acres aren't there and the bushel, bushels aren't there. If I was going to quibble with any of the USDA numbers right now, certainly I don't believe this 169 number. And I think satellite data backs that up and just, just general observations really put doubt on that. So, so yes, there was large carryout, but remember, a lot of that, more of that carryout than usual was left in farmer bins as opposed to commercial bins. So the farmers did have an ability to, to, to keep that basis strong, and they responded. And we've seen that eastern Corn Belt basis, like I mentioned, go from 65 over to 30 over. So it's not what it once was, mm -hmm. but it is still a reflection of reality. I think if you want a reflection of real concern from the end users who don't believe that the new crop is there and are trying to bid up that old crop, this basis is exactly where you see that. That reality. So watch the basis and I'm going to get your conspiracy theory in Market Plus on something related to that. But before I let you go real fast in corn, uh, if you maybe you're in the western corn belt, middle corn belt, and you got to empty those bins, do you do it? Yeah, sure. Uh, the basis is, is very good for this time of year. You've got an equivalent of 10 over the December at, you know, ADM in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, sort of a benchmark, but uh, uh, sort of processor level bids all across the Midwest are about zero. So really for this time of year, this is a good basis opportunity. And maybe the price isn't what we wanted it to be, but we, we did have a large crop in this old crop. 
We posted a picture on Twitter and Facebook, I think it was more of a tweet, uh, last week or early this week of pictures of soybean fields. And someone said, I zoomed in and looked and all I saw were blossoms. I didn't see pods. The video we showed you earlier, or we're gonna show you here in a minute, we'll show you pods. That was from Northeast Iowa. How good's that crop out there right now? Yeah, it looks nice. It looks <laughs> so, nice from the road, yeah, right? Yeah, from the road. But like I said, I'm much more worried about soybeans than corn when you talk about the frost concerns. Any sort of frost before, let's say, Halloween, there will be areas uh, That's in... That's pretty late, I Halloween. know, but, but a lot of that was planted really late. And right. I'm not. And here I'm not thinking about the northern tier of the Corn Belt, but southern Iowa, southern Illinois, where some of that was planted very late, uh, then, yeah, you've got to get into October to get those pods filled. So I'm very worried about the soybean uh, yield scenario by the time this is all said and done. Three month low, pushing near a 20 day average. The weather, it's been cooler. We've got tariff talks. We've got China buying, maybe. There's a lot of question marks facing soybeans right now. Right, so it's a weather market and we could get a rally, we could get a response from a frost, but that response will be going from a very low point. So cash prices in Iowa and anywhere west of Iowa or north of Iowa for soybeans is 90 under the November. That's like $7.80 per bushel for soybeans. That's yuck. Yeah. So, so sure we could get a bounce up from that if there is weather, which itself is a big if, and that bounce is still not going to take you to a price that you're going to like. No. Is there any chance there is a price I'm going to like after November? I mean, if it frosted in the next 10 days and took out in the entire U.S. crop, then maybe. Maybe. That's, but That's but, a pretty big <laughs> scenario right no, there. No, nobody is expecting that right. either. And you'd still feel bearish, you know, months down the line because there's the expectations for very large South American crops, given what the Brazilian currency has been doing, um, given just their scenario down there and their acreage expectations. So it's really hard to feel any sort of bullishness for soybeans beyond a little weather boost, any bullishness until a trade war gets solved. All right. Well, talk about cotton and the weather impact on Market Plus. So let's talk about uh, the cattle market. Uh, we have a fire in Kansas still being talked about because now members of Congress are wanting an investigation and also trade groups are wanting an investigation of what happened. Is that still having any impact on the cattle market? It's definitely having a profound impact on the market. The, the packers, because they are, they are now the bottleneck, they are the scarcity point in this industry, they're in the catbird seat and they have $500 a head packer margins or more, which is record large. So the consumer is still willing to pay for the beef. The beef, the wholesale beef prices themselves are holding up. It's just the packers don't have the capacity. The capacity fell, let's say, 6% with some of the estimates. Although when you actually look at the weekly slaughter numbers this past week, they're only down about 3% from a year ago level. So we probably haven't lost, or we're not really behaving as if we've <laughs> lost 6% of the capacity. Right. But the Packers are making money and they're pushing back against all of the fat cattle that otherwise would have been able to come to market. And we have those in the, in the lot now, that feeder market. We've heard about expanding the weights, holding out, waiting for something, right. the bottleneck. Any, any good news there with feeders? I, well, for the live cattle, I would expect yeah. a, a, a jump up from this or a recovery in the futures market because that drop that happened right after the fire was almost certainly an overreaction. You know, we've dropped twenty dollars from from the level it was on August first. So to me, that suggests that that a bottom has been found and a recovery could be seen. But with the feeders, I don't think they would necessarily had that same overreaction. They don't have the same sure. potential for for a recovery. All right, Costco opened up operations in China. That is seen as a possibility of putting more consumers over there in with U.S. pork. Pork mark, the hog market up uh, a good chunk this week, 7%, $4. Yeah. Is it going higher? Yeah, it could recover, certainly seasonally, and as you look out on the board, it would recover. But even this bullishness that we had this week, I think that is related to trade, and maybe not so much China, although the Costco story was good. You know, folks are lined up out the door. But I think perhaps the timing of the, the discussion with Japan uh, might have been enough of a, of a influence to send, send hog traders moving upwards. And in fact, that's one of the rare commodity markets where the funds are currently net long in futures. So I believe there is potential for them to continue building that hog position. One of those signs that we should be watching is what you're saying. Sure. Just keep looking at things like that. Absolutely. All right, you ready? I'll keep, you got 10 seconds. You get to finish your thought. I was just going to say that the hogs are the only one you can say that for. The funds generally, otherwise you look at the commodity markets, most of the grains, cotton too, is, is a pretty bearish scenario. All right. Elaine Cup, thank you so much. Thanks, Paul.
And that is going to wrap up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But we will keep this conversation going on Market Plus, Conspiracy Theory, remember? We'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. You know, our Facebook page is filled with links and photos. The more you like, the more you'll see from our page of at Market to Market. Join us again next week when we'll look at how demand for a Southwest specialty crop is heating up. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later.